This is the episode of what happened <clears throat> after the second summer in Alaska. After I had this life plan of, uh, okay, I'm going to go out into the world and, you know, expose myself to chance and uh, open myself up to uh, happenstance and just see what happens and sort of roll with it. Um, and what I what I did was I went to New York City. And I think the thing that's delayed this is that I can't really tell this part of the story without getting very personal. And I don't know. Somehow when I thought of doing this, I thought I would just skip over the really personal. I mean, you know, it's personal to tell you stories about drug use and, you know, prison and, what you know, stuff that's happened to me personally is obviously personal. But um, I can't tell you the story about why I went to New York without talking about a woman uh, who was a very important person in my life. And um, so some situations that I haven't really spoken about publicly and I never really thought I would. So anyway, I think that's why I shied away from this. I kept thinking there must be a way to tell the story without including all that. And, but that felt wrong because the whole point of this is I'm telling the stories of my life and to leave that out, it it would, um, it wouldn't be a real story. So here's what happened. Um, I met a woman in college at Hobart who I'm going to call Maria just to try to protect her privacy as much as I can. And I'm not going to get into too many details because it wouldn't be hard to figure out who I'm talking about. And I I don't want to, you know, she's not a public person and she never agreed to be part of this. So, um, but she's somebody that I was involved with <clears throat> from the time I met her, uh, which was 19, probably 80, 81 maybe, until we finally really called it quits in the early 90s, maybe 91, 92. So we're talking a long time that she and I, over a decade, that she and I were together. The thing is, we weren't really together. We, when I look back on this period of my 20s and the time I spent with her, it was more like we had three relationships, distinct relationships, um, with big, empty gaps separating them. So I knew her at college. She was this fiery, sexy, beautiful, lovely Puerto Rican girl from the Bronx who uh, came from a difficult situation economically, family-wise, personal experiences. She'd had a rough childhood. And uh, she'd lived in group homes and... I think she got a GED, didn't graduate from high school. But she was really smart, and some people around her recognized that, and she did some some sort of standard testing or something and scored very well, and she received a full scholarship to go to this private, very expensive uh, country club school, Hobart College. So she was there on a scholarship, but she was angry, really angry and alienated and didn't know how to deal with these rich, privileged white kids. And um, when I met her, uh, there was some sort of very deep chemistry between us and the fact that she was so frightened and alienated and angry and trusted me for some reason um, hooked me really deeply and touched me. I I don't mean, when I say hooked me, I don't mean that aggressively. She wasn't playing any, she wasn't trying to hook me. She, but I felt emotionally very deeply attached to her. And, um, 
And I guess I should include the fact that uh, she introduced me to uh, a sexual world that I had never had any clue about previous to that, which is a pretty powerful thing for a very horny 20-year-old guy or 19 or whatever I was. Um, Anyway, so when I was in Alaska, I was missing her. And the thing is, my 20s, basically, you can divide as uh, times when I was missing her and times when I was with her um, kind of going crazy because she was so difficult for me to be around. And part of that, I think, is that she was pretty crazy, uh, which isn't surprising given the the background that I sort of sketched out. Um, and I was kind of crazy, you know, myself. I was a young, restless, pedantic, demanding guy. And, um, and so we had these sort of series of like, you know, get together, have like amazing, great sexual chemistry, wonderful, um, just when we were together and really at peace with each other, there was a depth, um, a profundity of connection that was just mind blowing. Um, but then shit would go wrong. Things got weird. You know, I would think she lied to me or she disappointed me in some way. And then she'd get pissed off cause I was being judgmental and it, things just spiraled out of control relatively quickly and then I was feeling you know trapped uh by her and and resentful of her and you know god knows what she was feeling about me and and eventually we would separate and then we would uh begin missing each other and you know I'd meet other women and compare them to her and the connection I had with her and of course no one ever measured up and uh, I basically went through my 20s going through those cycles. Um, and so you'll hear about Maria in several future episodes of this. But I decided after my second summer in Alaska to go to Manhattan. And the reason I gave myself was, okay, I'm going to go see the world. So here's an idea. Let's go to a big city because I had like $5,000 or something saved from Alaska the from the working on the boat the second year. And uh, so I thought, okay, why not go to, Al- or to uh, New York? I'd never lived in New York before, and I had a weird relationship with New York because when I was a kid and we lived in Connecticut, I remember going into the city. My parents had um, friends who lived in Harlem, <clears throat> and We went to visit them. We had dinner at their place. Maybe we spent the day in the city. I don't remember. But I remember driving back to Connecticut and we left late, you know, been a dinner party and they were probably drinking and having a good time. And so we were leaving Harlem and this is in the, I was in high school. So this would have been like 78. Now, for those of you who don't know, New York in the 70s was rough. Uh, If you've seen the movie Taxi Driver, Urban Cowboy, I think it was it, Urban Cowboy, the one with Dustin Hoffman and John Voight. Um, Yeah, it it was rough. There was a lot of drug use, uh, heroin, a lot of like street violence, random shit happening, um, a lot rougher than it is now. And uh, anyway, so I'm... I was, what, 14, something like that, 15, 16, somewhere like that. And uh, and we were sitting, we had a station wagon car, and I was sitting in the back, like way in the back, and I was sideways, right? And we were stopped at a red light, and I remember it was probably midnight or one in the morning, and there were people hanging out on the street corner, and these dudes started fighting. And just as the light changed and my parent, you know, the car pulled away, so one guy smashed a bottle in like one movement. He smashed the bottle on the wall and came back and sliced this guy's face open. And my, my and nobody in the car saw it except me. And the car just pulled away and I just saw this blood and this guy go down. 
And I didn't, I didn't make a sound. I just, I, I wasn't even sure I'd seen it, you know, because then we were gone. It was gone. And uh, that image stuck in my mind for so long. And I just hated New York. I had this this feeling, this, this hatred, visceral hatred of the city. Um, and then when I was in college... I was in the city one time. We went down to visit with a friend of mine and we um, took some LSD and we were staying with his aunt, I remember, who had been a nun and now she wasn't a nun anymore. She was making lots of money and she had this beautiful apartment in Midtown and we're staying with her. God knows what she thought about having these two freaky college kids there, but we stayed with her for a night or two and... um, and uh, we went down to the village one night and we we took acid and I had these new army boots for some reason and my they really hurt my feet. And so we're running around tripping in the city, which is probably not the best thing to be doing. And And I took off my boots and I was wearing them around my neck and I was just walking around the village in these socks and um, and I just remember that everybody was really cool. And I don't remember examples, but I remember just this general feeling of like the city was a, was loving me and accommodating. And, and I just had this completely different experience of the city. And I, the one thing I remember is a homeless guy asking for money and I just sort of reached in my pocket and gave him whatever I had in my pocket and then we were walking down the street and a couple blocks he came up uh, running up and he said hey man hey hey wait you know you gave me all this change and there was a, a subway token in there keep keep a subway token I want to make sure you get home okay tonight and he gave it back to me and I just remember being so touched by that <laughs> and and so then I had a friendly I had a very different feeling about the city after that so after, you know, five years later, after a couple summers in Alaska, I decided to go back to New York and um, li- try living there for a while, you know. And I thought I'd get a job as a taxi driver, or work in a restaurant, whatever. Just it didn't really matter. The point was to be in New York, to spend a year in New York City and have this experience of living in a big city because I'd never lived in a big city before. And that just seemed like an interesting thing to do. Now, of course, that's the story. That's the narrative. But the other part, the really important part, is that Maria lived there. And I wanted to see what was going on. I, you know, I wanted to, the way I, I told it to myself was, you know, I wanted to see if this was real or not. Now, she and I had, you know, had this sort of tumultuous relationship for, I don't know if it was a year, a year and a half. When we were at school, she eventually quit school and she never graduated from there. And all kinds of weird shit happened. Um that she ended up living with my family for a while, even though she and I split up. And then I went back to school and she stayed with my family. And a very awkward, difficult, strange situation. And um, and then she she left and spent and just hitchhiked by herself around the country. And... During that time that she was, that I I didn't know where she was. I didn't know if she was alive or or not. And during that time, she um, got pregnant and had a baby. And yeah, the the story of why she had that baby and with whom and all that, I I don't feel comfortable telling here. But it was pretty extraordinary. Anyway, the guy she had the baby with was in prison and she had this baby and she was back in New York living with her mother in the Bronx with the baby. And so I show up in New York and I remember, 
I didn't really understand what the Bronx, the South Bronx, was. And so I was looking for an apartment in that neighborhood because she lived there. And that wasn't really the place to be looking for an apartment <clears throat> for a guy like me in those years. Definitely not. But I remember, like, you know, talking to real estate agents and looking at a couple of apartments. And anyway, I, and, and I also don't know why I thought I needed to rent an apartment as opposed to just look in the Village Voice which was the, you know, the weekly mag, uh, newspaper in the city that listed this was before the internet, before Craigslist and all that. That's where you'd find listings for jobs and apartments and, uh, you know, roommate kind of situations. I mean, knowing what I know now, obviously you're moving to a new city, you just get a room somewhere, right? Because you meet people, it's easy, you move in, it's cheap. But for some reason, I thought I needed to rent an apartment. I didn't have a job. And I, I had like $5,000. I, I don't know what the hell I was thinking. But I met this real estate agent who was, you know, I, the way I remember, she was like a, a MILF, a real uh, kind of a sexy woman in her, probably in her 40s. Um, and she took a liking to me and she rented me this apartment in Spanish Harlem. It was on... 106th and Lexington, <clears throat> which these days is kind of a nice neighborhood. Uh, but in those days, there were uh, no white people anywhere. It was Spanish Harlem. It was Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and black people. And um, she rented me this ground floor apartment. It was 10 feet wide, 40 feet long. It had two windows in the front with bars over them and that was it as far as the windows go and um the one wall one long 40 foot wall was um the wall shared with a playground so dudes were out there bouncing their basketball against the wall pretty much all night and all day and in front of the building you you know in the winter there'd be like guys standing around a fire in a barrel that kind of thing I think I paid $495 a month for it. <clears throat> and this was, what, 1984, five, something like that. So I had this apartment. God knows how that happened. And I got a job through friends of friends of my parents who owned a restaurant uh, on the Upper West Side, I think it was, an Italian restaurant. And I was working as a waiter there. <clears throat> and I'd only been there a couple of weeks. And there was a guy there one night eating by himself. Uh, and he was reading a novel called The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which was my absolute favorite novel at the time. I'd probably read it three or four times. And um, I started chatting with him. Oh, good book. Yeah, well, we have you read it. Yeah, What's the, what do you think about this character, that character, or whatever? And uh, it was late and it was slow. And he said, hey, what are you doing? You want to have a drink with me, whatever. Okay. So I sat down chatting and he was like, so what's your story? And I told him, you know, Alaska, now I'm in New York, just want to check it out. And he was about 10 years older than me. Uh, mid thirties. And, uh, so he said, well, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, no plans. He said, well, let's continue the conversation. Why don't you meet me uh, at my gym and we can chat while we work out. Okay. So he told me the address. And of course I'm thinking, yeah, this guy wants me to meet him at his gym tomorrow. <clears throat> uh, that's, you know, seems like a gay pickup line, but um, you know, as, as you already know, if you've listened to earlier episodes, I, I had several very close friends who, who were gay and I was comfortable in that world. And, um, you know, th there was, I wasn't worried about being <laughs> lured into something that I didn't want to do. So anyway, I, I met him at this gym and the gym was this very luxurious, 
uh, athletic club where like you, it was more like a five-star hotel than a gym. You know, they sort of took your code and you, you know, it was all very fancy and, and, uh, robes and slippers and the whole nine yards. So we're working out, you know, working out, we're like, you know, chatting while we, you know, bench press every once in a while on machines and stuff. And the conversation was really bizarre. I mean, this guy was obviously very, very smart. Um, and, but like this nervous sort of Jewish New York energy and, and the conversation was sort of half, uh, very practical and half very philosophical. So uh, to give you an idea, I remember one exchange where he was saying, you know, so, so let me ask you, Chris, do you, do you believe, uh, that people can really change? You know, or are people just set in their ways and, and that's it for life? And we talk about that for a while. And they, so what do you think happens, you know, after we die? Is, is there a, a hereafter or, or is it all just a make-believe that we uh, create because we're afraid of death? You know, what do you think about that? And, you know, and then uh, when you get back to your apartment tonight, if the lights don't work, what would you do? <laughs> like, What? Uh, well, I checked the fuse box. Oh, okay. Where's the fuse box? Oh, it's in the kitchen. And how many circuits are in your apartment? Um, I think there are two circuits. And and how many amps? Per, I think I don't know. Twenty amps each. I think. I, I, uh, okay, cool. And so, what is love real? You know, or is love just a figment of our imagination? That was the conversation. It was fucking bizarre. So later, I realized that what he was doing was he was interviewing me for a job. And the job was his personal assistant. He had basically just inherited uh, 20, 30, 40 million dollars worth of real estate in Midtown Manhattan. He, his father hadn't died, but his father wanted to stop running the family business, which was managing uh, these buildings in the Diamond District. And this guy, uh, let's call him Jim, was uh, taking over the business. Now, Jim was a really interesting character uh, because he was, um, he had been going to, uh, doing a PhD program in psychology, actually, in research psychology at a leading university, he had published, as a graduate student, he had published an article in, I don't remember if it was Science or Nature, but it was one of the premier scientific journals. And he had published this article as the lead author, which I'm telling you is unheard of. That is someone who's going far. That's like you know, that's an indication of a Nobel Prize in your future. That's a hell of a of a promising student. So he was doing really well. And that's when his father decided that he was going to retire. And Jim would have to come back from school and take over the family business because there was no one else who could do it. Jim had a brother, but... His brother wasn't well. I, I never really figured out exactly what the problem was, but there was um, some sort of mental illness um, with his brother. I, I only met him once. Struck me as, as like severely autistic, probably, uh, something on that spectrum. So his brother wasn't going to be able to manage millions of dollars worth of real estate in the Diamond District. So there was a lot of... Um, family pressure on Jim to come back and take over and do this. Now, this is all me uh, speculating, okay? And again, I don't want to get into other people's personal business, but in order to tell this story, I need to tell you all this stuff. I've changed Jim's name, obviously, um, but the Diamond District is a small community, so <clears throat> I, I want to be careful there, too, because it, it would be pretty easy to figure out who I'm talking about especially when you hear the rest of this. So uh, Jim it takes me back to his office. I don't know anything about the Diamond District. I've been in New York, like what, three months or something? 
uh, I, I, I'm clueless. And so he's really interested in my story. The, you know, I study literature in college. I did like Marxist literary criticism. I uh, was in Alaska doing these adventures and now I was setting off to see the world, but I, you know, wanted to stop in New York and have the New York adventure and, you know, experience and all that. He was fascinated by all that stuff. So uh, essentially he offered me a job as his personal assistant. And the deal was that he felt, again, this is me speculating, but he felt trapped by this life. He wanted to be a researcher. And his family responsibilities pulled him back from that and brought him into this world of money and business that bored the fuck out of him. So what he wanted to do was hire someone who could handle that stuff and free him up to do things that were more interesting, start new companies, entrepreneurship investments, you know, think of other things to do or just, you know, hang out and read or whatever. So partly he wanted to hire me um, to to do the the business end of things, which is managing leases and dealing with uh, and negotiating leases and dealing with um, contractors, you know, oh, the plumber's coming in to fix this thing and you got to, you know, move these people out and you got to set that up and move this and you got to take down these walls and put up that and we're going to put in you know, windows here and do the So it was all this sort of like minor construction stuff going on within the buildings, negotiating leases with the, the jewelers and all that and um, uh, dealing with money, essentially, money and, and, and logistics that would free him up to do other stuff. But at the same time, he wanted to hire someone who would be interesting enough for him to spend time with so that he wouldn't be bored out of his mind. And in fact, I remember when he offered me the job, I was really confused. And I remember saying to him, well, wait a minute, why would you want to hire me? I, I haven't like taken a math class since high school. And I failed it, to be honest. It was calculus. I fucking crashed out of it. You know, there are Harvard MBAs who would kill to have this job. And he said, how many of your friends in college studied business? I said, honestly, none of my friends studied business. And he said, none of my friends studied business either. I want, I'm going to be spending a lot of time with you. I want to be with someone who's interesting, uh, who I can have interesting conversations with and learn something with from. That's, that's why I'm offering you this job. So it was weird. The whole thing was weird uh, in a very good way, I guess. Uh, but it was definitely strange. And here, here's a guy, you know, handling tens of millions of dollars worth of real estate in the Diamond District. And he's hiring me essentially because I'm not interested in money. That's really what it came down to. And he wasn't either. That's the weird resonance that we had. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with New York and, and the Diamond District and all that, here's the deal. There's one block in Manhattan. You know, Manhattan has these zones, right? There's the the Garment District and there's the you know, the fish markets and the meatpacking district. And Manhattan historically had these different zones that uh, were sort of dominated by particular industries or businesses or, or cultural groups like Little Italy and Chinatown and all that. Now, as befits the business, the Diamond District is sort of the smallest and most concentrated of all those different zones and, and areas. It's one block. 47th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. It's right next to Rockefeller Center, Times Square. It's right in the center, right in the heart of Manhattan. And when I was there, I remember reading that 80% of all the diamonds sold in the United States physically pass through that one block. Every 
tenant in every building was involved in the jewelry business. They were gold dealers, diamond dealers, gemstone cutters. Um, Everybody had something to do with gold, diamonds, emeralds, sapphires, jewels. And the thing was, you had to have an address on that block to be taken seriously in that business. It's a very antiquated business, strangely. You know, there's so much money involved that you would think it would be very sort of high-tech Wall Street, but it's the opposite. It's very old school. These guys get together in this room, and they sell diamonds to each other, raw diamonds. They sit across a table with black felt on the table and they'll like have a little bag and they dump the bag of diamonds out and the other guy will look at them through a loop, you know, a little magnifying thing and he'll check them out and what and then he'll, he'll say, uh, you know, oh, okay, um, uh, $200,000 for all of them. And they'll negotiate out to 280. Okay. 260, whatever it is, they come to a deal, $260,000. They shake hands and the buyer walks away with the diamonds no money on the table because they know each other my father worked with your father my grandfather knew your grandfather and pretty much all of these dealers are hasidic jews so um if you go to new york go to the uh, diamond district walk down the street and you'll see all these guys with the top hats and the dark coats and the the braids and and they're all from the same community, and it's a very closed community. They've known each other. The families have known each other forever, and that's what enables them to make these deals um, on a handshake for hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably millions of dollars. So it's a very strange place, unlike anywhere else, um, certainly in the United States. I, I know Rotterdam in Holland is the other big uh, hub in the diamond business, <clears throat> but Anyway, I'm not even Jewish, right? Have no idea about high finance, real estate, commercial real estate, Manhattan, you know, uh, the jewelry. I don't know anything about any of these things. Um, but suddenly there I am in the middle of it, working with this guy who is who owns buildings that these people are are in. Um, they're coming to me asking, you know, to to rent office space, which is very difficult because there's 100% occupancy at all times. So if you look at the skyline of New York, <clears throat> you'll see that the buildings go way up in Midtown and then they drop down, you know, through the uh, Chelsea and all that. And then they go way back up at Wall Street. Um, and the reason for that is interesting. I, I always thought it was just a concentration of money and stuff, but um, a few years later, you'll hear another story of when I was in New York the second time working in a, on a construction job. One of the guys working in the construction job explained to me that what was the skyline of New York is, is a, an echo, of, in a way, of the bedrock under the island. The bedrock comes up to the surface in Midtown and then drops down 30, 40, 50 feet below the surface. So it's just dirt, right? Until you get to Wall Street, and then it comes back up to the surface again. And what that does is it allows them to make really tall buildings because they can drill and bolt the foundation of the building directly into bedrock, solid bedrock. So they can make these you know, 50-story high buildings because they're bolted into the rock. You can't make a building that high on dirt. And you can't like bolt. You can't run bolts fifty stories down or fifty feet down uh, till you find the bedrock, right? So, if you look at the geology of Manhattan Island from New Jersey or from Queens or you know from the east or the west, what you see is that it goes up in the middle, then down, then back up at the bottom, just like the buildings do. Anyway, the exception in Midtown is Forty Seventh Street because. Now they're starting to change a little bit. They're starting to to put up some higher buildings. But when I was there in the mid-'80s, there were no buildings higher than uh, 16 stories, I think. 17 stories was probably the highest one. 
And, you know, but a block away in Rockefeller Center, you've got skyscrapers and, and half a block away on Sixth Avenue skyscrapers. So it was this little pocket, this depression right in the middle of the Midtown Giants. And the reason for that is that the price per square foot uh, was so high in those buildings and they were always 100 percent full that it never made economic sense to get everyone out of the building and have no income for a couple of years while you were building a skyscraper, even though you, you know, have so much space extra when you finish the skyscraper, it never made sense to, to make that initial investment. Um, so that's why you had this depression there in terms of the heights of the buildings. So three months after arriving in Manhattan, Really knowing no one, having no contacts except uh, Maria in the Bronx, um, I was working in the Diamond District. And Jim used to take me home at night uh, to my apartment on 106 in Lexington when we worked late, which was often. <clears throat> He lived um, up the Hudson River a little ways, and uh, he had a, a limo. I think it was a, a white Mercedes-Benz limo with tinted win- windows and all this. And uh, we'd go up 6th Avenue, and he'd drop me. And <laughs> it was pretty crazy, you know, because there I was— the only white guy living anywhere within probably five, six, seven blocks radius. And I'm getting out of this white Mercedes stretch limo going into my shitty apartment and all these guys standing around the barrel fires would see me. And and looking back on it, I think that's why I never got jacked in that neighborhood because people must have thought I was you know, connected to the mafia or something. Because they'd see me, you know, like, what's this white dude, this young white guy doing in this shitty neighborhood, the shitty apartment, but he's getting a ride, he's getting dropped off in this white Mercedes stretch limo. What the fuck's going on? I think that probably saved me. So I'm working on... 47th Street as this guy's assistant and we get to be better and better friends and essentially I took over running the buildings he was doing other stuff and um, then he and I got to be quite close and the first year I was there it was fascinating I learned so much uh how money works, how to deal with contractors, practical things, how buildings are put together, how the heating system works, how the mafia uh, functions in Manhattan, how uh, unions work, how to hire people, how to fire people, how to, I was, you know, I was in my mid twenties at that point And Essentially, um, every everyone in the two buildings who worked for the buildings, the maintenance guys and the security guys, reported to me. And so my job was to handle stuff that I could handle. If there was something that I couldn't handle, then I would take it to, to Jim. But essentially, Jim, I was the buffer between the owner and the operations of these buildings. So I probably had... I don't know, 20, 25 people who reported to me <clears throat> because these buildings have a lot of security. Uh, they've got every office has double doors, um, bulletproof glass, camera systems in the in the vestibules, in the offices, in the hallways, in the elevator. There's an armed guard in the lobby of every building. And... Uh, yeah, I remember hanging out with the guard downstairs who became a friend of mine. <laughs> he was a really cool guy. He had a he was like six six probably, um three hundred pounds, huge guy. Not a guy you'd want to to have to mess with, definitely. And he had a Walter PPK 
nine millimeter pistol semi automatic that he always had uh on his belt and he would just hang out in the lobby and one day he and I were hanging out just watching the girls go by and he said to me so chris what what's the most thrilling thing you've ever done and I was like, wow, that's a good question. And I think I said like whitewater rafting or something. I don't remember what the hell I said. But I remember what he said. It was firing a shoulder-launched missile because that's what he had done in the military. Apparently the guys who shoot those things have to be really big, steady dudes so that the recoil doesn't like throw you all over the place. So his job was shooting down – um, target drones or something <laughs> with Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. And uh, he remembered that as a, as a pretty uh, exciting thing. The guard in one of the other buildings, I remember, um, killed a guy one morning uh, when I got to work. He, he had come to work a few minutes before me and... I don't remember the details, but someone had tied, had like got, slept overnight and then like forced their way in to an office, tied the people up, took all the money and was fleeing when he showed up in the morning and he chased them. And I remember he shot the guy uh, on the corner of 48th and 6th Avenue. And I, when I came to work, someone told me, oh, my God, he just, I remember the guy's name, but you know, he, this just happened. And I ran, and by that point, they had taken, the cops had taken him away, and the body was gone, but they had uh, the tape, you know, the police line do not cross thing. Uh, and there was a pool of blood and a fedora hat. That was all there was on the sidewalk. Strange. Then I went down. I guess I, I was sent down to bail him out. That was one of my one of my interesting functions in that job. Uh, it's hard for me to tell this story because there's so much. So much. I spent two years there. And uh and I'm not even telling what happened with Maria in this time. Uh, essentially what happened was she decided that she didn't, that she wasn't ready to have this child and she had the child under duress and she decided she wanted to put the child up for adoption, which made her mother kick her out of the apartment. So she moved in with me and the the reason I'm hesitant to talk about this is I don't know how much of it's true. I don't know if her mother kicked her out of the apartment. I don't know why she decided to put her daughter up for adoption. I'm I'm terrified to think that she did it because she thought she had to do it to be with me. I don't know. I hope that's not why she did it. But I don't know. Um, she moved in with me. That, as you can imagine, was very difficult uh, in that tiny little apartment. And around this time, I'd probably been working there four months or so. Uh, three months maybe. And around that time, one night when Jim dropped me off, he said, what are you doing, man? What are you living up here? You're going to get killed up here. This is crazy. He said, why don't you move? Why don't you move down to 47th street? We'll put you up and we'll, uh, we've got some ap apartments in the, in the building that, uh, you know, I'll put you in there. And I was like, what, well, what are you saying? He's like, no, it's no problem. It would be better for me because when the alarms go off at night, I have to get in the car. I have to drive all the way down to the city and deal with this shit. If you're there, you'll have the codes. 
if the alarm goes off, you can, they're almost, they're always false alarms. You'll have the codes, you can go, there was a big vault and there are all these things with alarm systems. You can go turn off the alarm and just go back to bed. It'll be better for me, better for you. So essentially, six months after arriving in New York with no connections, no idea what I was doing, I was living rent-free in Midtown in a penthouse apartment uh, on Fifth Avenue. That was pretty intense. That was pretty amazing. And so after a year, so I'm living, I'm there for a year, which means I'm in this free apartment for six months. My salary keeps going up. Because my value to this guy was going up and we were becoming friends, very, very good friends, actually. Uh, and but but the friendship was based on a mentorship kind of thing. He was 10 years older than me. He had kids. He was married. He was locked into this life. And looking back on it now, I feel that he was locked into a life he didn't really, he wasn't sure he wanted, but he he, he couldn't refuse it. And so he found this sp- free spirit, this young guy who was going off to see the world, and he offered this young guy a taste of the life he wasn't sure that he himself wanted, and by convincing this young guy to give up his plans to go and see the world, what he was doing was validating the decision that he himself had made. Do you see what I'm saying? So it wasn't just about me. It was about proving to himself that this was the good life. And the problem is that for the first year or so, I was so... Uh, interested by how different all this was and how bizarre and how novel. I mean, who would have ever predicted that I would be, you know, living in a penthouse apartment, paying no rent, uh, making a shitload of money in midtown Manhattan in the Diamond District? Nobody, nobody ever could have predicted that. And that in itself was enough of a mind fuck that it interested me. But after a year, I started getting bored because essentially I'm not interested in money. I never was. And so this sort of set into motion an essential conflict. Um, and it didn't really interfere with our friendship initially. But what happened was that um, I started, because this guy was my friend when we were out for dinner or drinks or whatever, you know, I talked to him about how I was feeling. And, you know, I wanted to see the world. You know, I, I wanted to backpack through India. I wanted to see the Himalayas. I wanted to float down the Mekong River on a raft. You know, I I wanted to, like, get out there and do crazy shit while I was young and free. And he wanted me to stay and be his friend and be his healthy brother and validate the life that he had sort of been forced into, but had also chosen. And uh, I remember one night at dinner when I was griping about this again, I remember him saying to me, Chris, how old are you? And I said, whatever it was, 27, I guess it probably was. And he said, listen to me. By the time you're 30, you'll have a net worth of a million dollars. If you don't, I'll write you a check for the difference. I'll put that into writing. So stay here, do this work. And I I had absolute freedom too, by the way, because my only boss was him. 
right? And he was desperate for me to stay. So I could show up late. I could do it. It was a job where I just, you know, took care of business, but nobody gave a shit how or when I did it. Uh, you know, he was like, you can read, you can study, you can enroll at Columbia and go do some classes up there. You're, you're living in the greatest city in the world. And I was, I was probably making like $50,000 a year, which was a lot of money in those days. Um, and living rent free in Manhattan. Right. And there was a BMW car in the garage, his car, he had five or six cars. I could use the car whenever I wanted, go away for the weekend, you know, carte blanche. Uh, yeah, I remember him saying, yeah, I'll write, I'll put that in writing. You'll have a million dollars net worth when you're 30. So what happened is, well, as you can imagine, I'm living with a woman I've already proven unable to live with who's under insane amounts of stress because she's going through the adoption process of her daughter who was already two, maybe two and a half by then. Um, very difficult period for her. And, you know, we're, we're sharing the studio apartment. And, um, so it, things got to the point where we couldn't handle it anymore. I rented her an apartment somewhere else. And so there was just, it was just drama, drama, drama all the time. And um, one day I'm sitting in my office and I remember, <laughs> I just remember it perfectly. A woman walked into my office wearing denim jacket red leather cowboy boots, beautiful woman, sexy, um, probably 40, something like that, 35. Her name was Catalina Montero Alvarez. She was from Madrid, but she lived in Ibiza. And she was a Spanish journalist who was traveling around the world and financing her travels by writing feature articles about interesting places that she encountered on the way. And she wanted to write an article about 47th Street. And uh, the guard downstairs who had launched the shoulder-launched missile uh, sent her up to my office, partly because he knew I could show her around and partly because he was trying to get me laid. He was very good about that. And... uh, So I showed her around. I took her up on the roof uh, where you could see through the window across the street to the the diamond um, trading floor. Uh, You could never get in there. There was no way they'd let either of us in there. But we could sort of see what was happening through the window. And I told her a bit about the history of the street and showed her around. Anyway, we went out to dinner that night. And... uh, I remember she showed me some photos that she'd taken in India and in the Philippines and in uh, Guatemala. And she'd actually been to San Cristobal de las Casas, where I lived with the land reform people. I think I talked about that in an earlier episode. But anyway, she, she showed me these pictures from Asia. And I remember something in me snapped and I realized like I'm I'm miserable here this isn't where I want to be and time goes by and okay yeah I'll have a million dollars but I'll be it's three years of my life worth a million dollars and and who will I be then you know, if if I agree to stay here for another three years for $3 million, what will happen to me? What will happen to me? Will I change in ways that I won't be able to leave then? Because then he'll say, stay another two years, it'll be another million, and then another million, and then, you know, what, I'll, I'll start doing coke and hanging out in nightclubs and, you know, buying crazy shit. I mean, what's going to happen to me? 
I won't I won't still be me. I'll be three years older and I'll I'll be someone who knows that he sold three years of his life for for a million dollars, which isn't who I am right now. Anyway, I'm not saying I articulated all this, but I felt it. I felt like I'm not being true to myself. I'm not learning anymore here. I'm just killing time for money. So I went in the next day and I told him I have to quit. I got to leave and um, I'll, I can stay until you hire someone else, but I, I got to leave. And he went down to this place called 47 street photo, which was, I think it doesn't exist anymore, but it was like the only non jewelry related thing. No, that's not true. There was 47 street photo and there was a bookstore, a famous bookstore, the sort of below street level, um, both of which are gone now. <clears throat> but anyway, he, he went down there and he bought me what was at the time the best camera I think you could buy, which was a Nikon F3 high eye point and a 35 to 135 millimeter zoom Nikkor lens. And he gave it to me as a going away gift, which was a really beautiful gesture. Um, and I learned, I learned to shoot photography with that camera and actually sort of became a semi professional photographer for a while and sold a few photos and had a few, you know, I had one photo that was on a cover or on a, on a calendar and won a contest and all that. But anyway, I've left a lot of things out, but I've been talking for an hour, so that's enough. Um, I'll probably revisit this experience. I'll refer to it in, in future episodes, but I think I've told the story as well as I could uh, without making it too specific and, and talking about things that would invade other people's privacy. Um, yeah. So I don't know how long I stayed after that, maybe a couple of weeks. And, and then I, uh, I took the money I had saved, which was about $15,000. I bought a one way ticket to new Delhi and I flew to new Delhi. So next episode will be what happened when I got to New Delhi. Thanks for listening to this. I, I can't believe anybody out there is interested enough to, to spend their time doing that, but I appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you next time from New Delhi.